Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest edition of our Candid Conversation series. Today, we're focusing on women who are truly changing the game. I am Gina Miller here with FC Dallas. We are coming to you live from Toyota Stadium in Frisco, Texas. We have a great conversation planned over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. We are really focusing on women during Women's History Month, the month of March, and we're focusing this conversation on game changers in their respective sports and industries. We are so excited to have three remarkable guests with us who are going to share their stories, their insight, and their experience. And this is truly an interactive conversation. So please post your questions down below in the comments section. Every single one of our guests is happy to answer your questions and, and share some candor about what life is like in the locker room, on the basketball court, on the pitch, and in the boardroom. So we are so excited to have a very special guest from outside the FC Dallas organization, Vicki Johnson, the head coach of the Dallas Wings. Thanks so much for joining us, Vicki. You're so welcome. We appreciate to see you. And we're also excited to have Megan Miller and Melissa Janetta from FC Dallas, my colleagues here at FC Dallas joining us as well. Thanks guys. Thanks for having us, Gina. We Thanks, are Gina. We are streaming live on Facebook. So again, answer your, post your questions in the comments section for any of us to address and we will get right to them. So let me introduce our panelists to you a little bit more substantially. Vicki Johnson is entering her first season as the head coach of the Dallas Wings. She joined the Wings from the Las Vegas Aces, a team that went to the playoffs three straight seasons. Prior to the Aces, she was the head coach of the San Antonio Silver Stars after spending seven years as an assistant with the club. She was the 12th overall pick by the New York Liberty and played in the WNBA's inaugural season in 1997 through 2009. She played collegiately at Louisiana Tech, where she was a all, two-time All-American and won the NCAA title in 1994. She's also in the Louisiana Tech Hall of Fame. No accolades there at all, Vicki. None. <laughs> None at all. <laughs> Megan Miller is the Vice President of Partnership Marketing at FC Dallas and Toyota Stadium. She's entering her 11th season with the club. She and her team oversee all the corporate partner activation for FC Dallas, Toyota Stadium, and North Texas Soccer Club, as well as the National Soccer Hall of Fame. The homegrown DFW native previously worked with partnership in corporate partnership services for 10 seasons with the Dallas Cowboys. We overlapped by, I think, two seasons at the Cowboys. She was part of the Super Bowl 45 experience here in North Texas, and she also oversaw multiple player appearances, partner events, and promotions throughout her duration with the club. Megan graduated from Texas Women's University with a degree in general studies with concentrations in business and sociology. Well, that's a mouthful there. At Southern New Hampshire University, she graduated from there with a master's in human resource management. Melissa Janetta is the Vice President of Business Development for FC Dallas, responsible for leading the club's corporate partnership efforts. In her 12th year with the club, Janetta and her team are focused on areas such as naming rights, venue entitlement positions, and other sponsorship opportunities across multiple categories. She holds an MBA in leadership from Southern New Hampshire University and a Bachelor of Science in Marketing from Michigan State, where she played four years for the women's soccer team. Great group today and a great group who's eager to, to truly address some of the elephants in the room to provide some real candid insight on a lifetime in sports. So I get asked this all the time as, as I was a sports broadcaster, you know, there was nobody for me to look up to in the early to mid nineties when I wanted to get into sports broadcasting. And I didn't even think about being a woman in the business. I just, I wanted to be Bob Ortigal, the former Dallas Mavericks play-by-play -play guy. I want to talk basketball for a living. Um, I'm curious how each of you got started in, in working in sports and deciding that this was a career path that you wanted to pursue. Vicki, I'd love to start with you. Well, uh, I dreamt of uh, playing basketball uh, at Louisiana Tech, uh, where I graduated from. Um, I, I had no idea I wanted to coach until the end of my career. Uh, I always was a, a player coach uh, on the court, uh, my, my teammates always looked up to me. Um, but the coaching part, I didn't know anything. Um, I didn't know I had the ability to coach uh, because of my patience uh, and because uh, the person I was as a player, uh, I was very uh, detailed. Uh, I, 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 I didn't, uh, I couldn't understand um, 
why players couldn't understand. And so, uh, and so in teaching, uh, when I became a coach um, later in my career, uh, after my 12, my 13 years in the W, um, my first year was very difficult. Um, when I finished playing in the W, I still played uh, two years overseas. Uh, so I still had that play, player mentality. Uh, and I was never a player uh, that needed a coach to tell me to go into the gym to work on my game. And uh, the generation had changed. And so as a, as a, as a player now starting my uh, coaching career, it was very difficult uh, for me to, uh, to, to truly understand how I could reach uh, my players uh, as a player coach uh, until I spoke to one of my friends, um, she was on the college level and I was like, you know, coaching is not for me. Uh, she was like, no, you, you're a great coach. Uh, you understand the game. You just have to, you know, take your time and really, uh, pay attention to the detail and, and not skip uh, steps. So, uh, that really changed my life as a coach. And I think that's why I'm, I'm a better coach today. So many follow-ups there I want to get to a little bit later in the conversation, but making a career transition and going from player to coach is very, very difficult. We've seen a lot of players who are not great coaches because right. the ability to communicate, the ability to teach, and in essence, right, for sure. so hard to do. How were you able to successfully make that transition? Well, it was, it was difficult for me because I finished my uh, coaching career, uh, I mean, my plan career in San Antonio. And that's where I start coaching. Uh, so I was coaching players that I had played with for four or five. Becky Hammond, for example, that's the assistant coach for uh, the Spurs. Uh, I had played with her in New York for seven years and I played in San Antonio with her uh, for three years. Uh, so it's very difficult. Uh, with one, um, she's one of my dear friends. Uh, now I go from playing with her, now coaching her. Uh, but thank God, um, I, I was a leader on and off the court and in a sense uh, where uh, they respected me uh, as a player and as a person. And then the coaching uh, part was pretty easy. Um, I was nervous with her, especially uh, being in front of the group as far well as, uh, you know, telling her what to do. And, but um, it, was, it was an easy transition for her because she was a vet. Uh, she went from calling me VJ to Coach VJ uh, in front of uh, our search, uh, our, our young team. So uh, she made my transition very easy, but it was very difficult because now I have to, I had to separate myself as a friend, as a teammate to earn that respect as a coach. So many things to dive into there, but I want to get to Megan here. And Megan, you started kind of when I started in the sports business, when there were not a lot of women in the locker room and or women in sports franchises either. And, and we were fortunate to work for the Dallas Cowboys at the time who really, you know, empowered women at a very high level. You know, there were two women in the TV department, and that was in a time when there were no women working in more than one market at a time. You know, it was just, it was a very unique time, Megan, working for the Dallas Cowboys when we did. I worked at the TV department with myself and a, a female sports photographer. And you just never saw that in, in local TV newsrooms or newsrooms across America. How did you know that you wanted to start working in sports? And, and, and what was that catalyst for you to get you in the game? I wish I had as good of an answer that I just heard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I give some credit to my brother, Aaron. Um, you know, he got me into tennis when I was in junior high. And I started um, in tennis before I was even at the Dallas Cowboys. So we played together, played up through high school. And then when I started college, I was given the opportunity to work at a tennis facility. And I thought, do what you love. You hear that all the time. So I did, and then he also gave me the reference to Four Seasons. So I thought, okay, I, I think I, I haven't stayed there, but I think that's an incredible company. And went over there, I was there for five years. Um, you know, it led me into the Dallas Cowboys after, but mine's that simple. I just got really lucky being able to start in, in a sport I play. I know you just were referencing basketball. Melissa's gonna reference soccer. <laughs> 
you know, I've bounced around on three sports, but I got really lucky with that. So I think my brother would be proud that I'm giving credit for this one. <laughs> Family connection always comes into play there. It really yeah. does. And I think it's important. And Melissa, you, you were a soccer player. Was it a foregone conclusion that you were going to work in soccer or tell us about your path to working in the sports industry? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, Vicki and Megan probably can relate, you know, when you graduate from college and you're a, an athlete, um, you kind of go through a little bit of an identity crisis because especially, you know, as women, um, if you're not fortunate enough to be able to go on and play professionally, you know, that's the highest level that you know that you'll reach. So um, when I was thrown out into the real world, um, I knew that I wanted to keep that connection with sports. Um, and so I was lucky enough to land an, an internship on the brand side with Anheuser-Busch in Chicago, which is a fantastic sports city, um, and helped their fulfillment team um, with their grassroots promotion. So, you know, spending my nights in the bars in, in Wrigleyville, Gina, was not a bad way to kind of leave the nest of college life and, and get tossed into the real world. But it also you know, gave me my first taste um, into, you know, what I studied in college, which was marketing um, and how it was applied into, you know, with, in tandem with sports. So I think from, from then it was kind of love at first sight for me. Wow. I absolutely love that. You know, I paid to be in bars when I was fresh out of college. You got paid <laughs> you in bars when you were fresh out of school. I mean, hello, dream job. Um, so I know each and every one of you get this, and I know you understand it. Most people think that when you work in sports, when I worked in sports broadcasting, for example, people thought I just showed up and went on TV. And I always tell students, no, you do more homework. If you're going to be a sports broadcaster, once you are out of school, than you ever did when you are in school, you actually do stuff during the day <laughs> to prepare for game day, which really isn't the majority of your day. Megan, explain what you do as the vice president of partnership marketing for FC Dallas. Sure, no. Um, I mean, where do I begin? We, you know, once Melissa's team sells that deal, it comes to our team. I can brag on our group that we work with a phenomenal group. You know, we onboard the clients from the beginning. We educate them on how we can go out in the marketplace together on game days. It's not just about a sign anymore. It's not just here's your tickets. It's, um, and you're asking me specifically about game days right now, going back before what, you just do, what does your job entail? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you know, what you do on game day is so important, but preparing for game day is so exhausting for people who might be interested in partnership marketing. What does it entail? Sure. Yeah. And I think, okay, so thanks for reframing that for me. You know, the key, the key word really is we're in service. So you've got to love it because there's a lot of hours. There's a lot that you put into it. As far as what we do day to day, it looks different every single day. Some days, like you mentioned, we're behind our computers working all day. You're meeting with clients, you're meeting out in the market, you're meeting here at Toyota Stadium. Um, we plan their entire package for them, whether we're planning on co-branding out in the community, um, whether our group is sitting together with the marketing department coming up for a plan with them. You know, some of them bring their marketing agencies on with them, um, but we've got some partners that haven't been in this space before. So um, every single day looks different. Um, I'm trying to think of something amazingly exciting, like you said, you know, it's not like um, we're out just whining and dining. We're in the office pounding, um, trying to figure out the best way to showcase our brand because we don't say sponsorships here. It's about a partnership from day one. So, I mean, I could probably take the entire hour talking about this, um, but I think the big thing is collaboration. Speaking with our partners about what do you wanna do because this year looked very different from last year. So the way we pivoted from year to year on their assets, um, is, is something we pretty much have to evolve and do every single year with them. So it's meetings internally and externally. It's the regular computer stuff. And we get to go out and have fun too. I mean, we're here on site. So we go do stadium walkthroughs on beautiful days um, and look at ways we can enhance our partner's visibility on game days. So um, 
hopefully that's a good answer because I really could probably take the entire time talking about it. I think each of us could because there's so much nuance that goes into what it is you do. And I think Melissa, you know, it takes so long to land a huge partnership deal. We see both you and Megan in front of the MTX jerseys. MTX, which just introduces FC Dallas's new front of jersey partner, a hero partnership uh, this year, which is exciting news. But these deals take time and effort and, and, and relationship development. Can you describe what it is that is involved with being a vice president of business development? Yeah, yeah. So um, leading the team that... Um, you know, they're really looking for partners that brand alliances, if you will. So partners that are looking to move their brand forward, reach a different audience than the general sports fan in America, a younger audience, a digitally native audience. So there's a lot of research and analytics that goes on first prior to even reaching out to the brand to see if they'd be interested in talking to us about a partnership. Um, so it is a, a lot of research, a lot of uncomfortable cold calls, if you will, to people that may have never heard of, um, of you before or have, um, you know, aren't very savvy in the soccer space in the country or major league soccer. Um, and so as Megan mentioned, you know, once we get to the point where we find somebody that is a good match or brand alliance with us, um, we build the platform, um, kind of the foundation or the blueprint of the partnership before we pass it on to Megan and her team to really fulfill and, and make the magic happen, if you will. So, and, and I think there's such an appreciation internally for, for, the, for the effort that your team puts in, but externally, I think it's so worth highlighting because it's not all whining and dining and taking pictures, holding up jerseys <laughs> at all, at all. And I think it's very, very similarly on the coaching side, Vicki, I mean, you know, it, it's not just showing up on game day and, and all of us work in sports. We know coaches <laughs> usually arrive before the sun comes up and leave after the sun sets. Uh, we see, we've seen this a lot over the years, but can you describe what life is like for you on a daily basis outside of game day? Uh, it's a lot of preparation. Uh, it's a lot of uh, film uh, watching. Uh, it's the NCAA tournament uh, right now. Uh, so for example, I started my day watching games at one o'clock. Uh, basketball games on TV, uh, trying to uh, figure out who we who we're going to take at one, two, uh, five, seven, and, and thirteen. Um, so uh, that's a little piece of it. Uh, and also my uh, uh, nine players that's overseas, uh, making sure they're okay, um, uh, making sure uh, I connect with them. Being a new head coach here in Dallas. Uh, it's very important for me to understand them as uh, as 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 individuals first, before I even involve the basketball part of it, and then uh, my coaching staff. Uh, I have three coaches uh, that I'm responsible for trying to uh, uh, meet with them every day for two hours, uh, going over strategy, uh, uh, helping them uh, understand our league. Uh, and then uh, we haven't even discussed uh, our team, you know, and what 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 what's our goals, uh, what's our expectations, expectations, um, what um, uh, the, each each individual roles, uh, and then interviews as well for myself, you know, doing interviews and stuff, um, connecting with the community, um, bringing the awareness uh, to Dallas. Uh, that uh, there, there is a professional uh, women's basketball league here and uh, we're expecting great things. Uh, so really just getting out, um, really explaining my vision, uh, my purpose and my goal for uh, this team uh, and, and building a winning uh, franchise uh, to be able to one day be in the history book uh, as the Dallas Cowboys, you know, winning championships, uh, the maps as well. Um, so it, it's a lot uh, goes into uh, to building uh, uh, a team. Uh, but for me, it's just really just preparing. Uh, we're off for six months and we're in season for six months. Um, so there's no sleeping. Uh, there's no sleeping as a head coach. Um, you sleep for about two, three hours. You wake up in the middle of the night, you come over to play uh, because it's all about you. Uh, it's about 
what I can do better uh, to help my uh, players uh, achieve uh, their highest goal and their highest expectation. And then putting that together as a team, convincing them that it's important to, uh, to, to think about the team and uh, the team goals over our own individual goals. So that's a challenge within itself because um, I have some of the, the, the most prestigious college athletes uh, in the W that come from the most prestigious universities, uh, Connecticut, um, Notre Dame, Tennessee, uh, 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 Oregon, uh, so, um, and South Carolina. So uh, they understand what it takes to win. Uh, they're not very pleased in losing. Uh, so, uh, so I have to con continue to, to motivate them and let them know that it's always a bigger goal. And, and it's better to stand together than uh, fall apart. There are a lot of consistent themes here, but there's one that I think is pretty consistent for all of us. It's, you know, before you get the glamor gig and the glamor role and the glamor opportunity, you gotta do the grunt work. Yes. You gotta do the grunt work. <laughs> I, always, I always say, I always say like practice, it's like baking a cake. Practice defense, you know, you, you, you go through the plays, you, you do the, the suicides and stuff like that. And then game day, is you get to enjoy the cake. <laughs> yes. I love the, winning, that. the winning part of it is the icing on the cake. <laughs> it's so true. It's yeah. so true. And what's what's also consistent here is that each of you have had so much career success. And and let's be real candid. Not everyone who sets out on an ambitious competitive career path which is the career paths each of us have chosen. Not everyone who sets out on an ambitious competitive career path will achieve that type of success. So I'd like to know what's been critical and what's been crucial and, and important to success in your area of business. And, and Melissa, I'll start with you. You just closed, we just mentioned this, one of the biggest, if not the biggest hero deal in FC Dallas history or one of them, you know, that front of Jersey partnership is something that is seen every time FC Dallas takes the field, travels, practices, trains, talks, you know, does everything, eats, because um, eating is a big part of what we do here. <laughs> it, it, it was a big deal, but that's just one feather in the cap, if you will. What are some of your keys to success in your area of business? Yeah, I think, you know, and you had to learn this kind of baptism by fire early on in my career is, you know, you're going to get a lot more no's than you get yeses. So, you know, not taking that personally, almost taking it as a, you know, one step closer to getting a yes. Um, so being persistent, not giving up. Um, and at the end of the day, really believing in, and I think this translates outside of the sports industry, you know, you have to believe in the product that you're selling. Otherwise, people are going to see right through you. So, um, you know, I authentically at the end of the day, love what I do and love um, the club and the league that I work in because I feel like, you know, I'm growing the sport in this country. Um, and so I think that that you know, is really important um, when you're faced with those challenges of having to pick yourself up and, and dust yourself off every day. Because I can tell you, you know, we, the, the Jersey deal that we did, we've, we pitched it a hundred times before we got, you know, to that yes. And that can be defeated, defeating, especially when you start that sales cycle two years in advance. And, you know, this deal um, actually, this partnership closed um, at the end of, or at the beginning of this year in January. So you can imagine it was two years of no's before we got to the yes. There's, but it makes us so much sweeter. It, when does, you get it does. The longer the wait, the bigger the reward. And there's so many things there that I tell colleagues, teammates, uh, you know, students that I'm speaking to, be comfortable with no, because you're going to hear a lot of no's on the path to getting a couple of yeses. And professional persistence. If you want to go into sales, professionally persistent in a nice way has got to be part of your wheelhouse, isn't it? It's, it's one of your Absolutely. skills. Sure. Absolutely. It is. It is. And, and Vicki, I can imagine in your case as well, whether it comes to recruiting players or, or, you know, or, you know <laughs> co recruiting, coaching, all those things, that professional persistence is so important to you, but you're a hall of famer. You won the WNBA's sportsman award, sportsmanship award. Um, what have been some of your key factors to the success you've had in your career? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is, is, is really defining my why, why do I do this? Um, and it's not about me. It's about, uh, serving, uh, other people. Um, I'm not, I have never been one to seek, um, the attention, the spotlight. Um, 
I'm always, I've always been that helper. Uh, so that's why uh, I coach. Uh, that's why I play. Um, but, but coaching part of it, uh, understanding my why um, is the most important thing, I think, in life. You know, in anything you do, you have to understand your why. And once you understand your why, you'll find your passion and you'll be able to do it for free. You know, uh, you don't have to get paid, you know, and, uh, and you don't really look at the time because time just flies uh, because you're actually having fun and what you do. Uh, and I think uh, another thing is, is you have to have confidence in yourself. Uh, if, if you're a leader and, and you're trying to start something or you're trying to sell something, uh, you have to be able to, uh, to believe in what you're selling. And, and, and I think that's the most important thing uh, for me as a head coach. Uh, I believe in this league. I believe in my players. Uh, I believe in their ability. And then to give them the necessary steps to achieve those goals as individual and as a team. And also I think, um, always be uh, the answer to the problem. You know, being the answer to the problem, you will always be needed <laughs> in that sense. And it's, it's better to be able to, to do multiple things than just to be a scorer or just to be a defender. But if you can do both or you can rebound or you can, you know, run, jump, uh, it just add value to you. I think that's the most important thing. That five tool player, if you will, and 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 I, and I see people who who you know want to sort of punch their ticket to the corner office, and I say there's so much value in those entry level positions where you yes, do everything. I mean, as a sportscaster starting out, I was a reporter, photographer, editor, producer, anchor. I did everything. I pulled cable, and now I still have the skill set to do any of those things if I, if I need to pinch in and do something else. It's so important to be that five tool player, if you will. And you and you're able to teach. Absolutely. You know, and, and so the detail part of it is, is very important as well. You know, I, I think if you pay attention to small details, the small things, you definitely will pay attention to the big things. Well, Megan, your team has won MLS activation of the year. I mean, you've had real success. We know there's a lot of competition for things like that. And, and your team has really done a great job of, of retaining those partners in a year that was very challenging during COVID-19, you know, and every, every partner of FC Dallas tells me candidly, you know, we're partners with lots of sports teams, but we love our partnership team here at FC Dallas. They just, they take such good care of us and they make us feel like a family member, something that you alluded to earlier. What's critical to that level of success there, to have partners love you, want to stay with you during very challenging times, and to get that professional recognition at, at a very high level? Oh, well, thank you. You know, I, I think this one's easy for me. It's communication. Um, you know, and you, you asked me earlier about what I do every day, and I think communication is absolutely key in being the best in the business. It's not just internal, you know, you know best, we have internal meetings all the time, but it's sharing with the stakeholders outside of our department. You know, our department affects everyone in the company. So the key to that is being really, really consistent. So if I get a bit of information and I don't share it immediately, it puts other departments behind. Um, you know, the same thing, it really pertains to our partners. So, you know, we develop, we've got these business relationships, we work together, we collaborate, but you become friends with them over the years as well. So I think when you really get those relationships to a great point, you can work together and say, I don't like the way this worked last year. Let's blow it up and try something new. Last year proved that with us. But I think it's communication all day long. And I don't mean to be cliche with that answer, um, but we, you know, that you guys know better than anyone. This is not a nine to five job. We are working all the time, seven days a week. It's things we've adjusted to at this point in our career. But if a partner calls me on a Saturday, we pick up and we put things into action. So I think it's just about being really genuine with them. I, you know, now we're at a point again, it's like, let's do things that work for both brands in the environment that we're in. So um, I love it. I love the open communication we have here internally at FC Dallas. 
with our partners and we've had some really good things come from that. And just like this, a really candid conversation. So that's been the key, I think, to our group. You know how I feel about the conversation aspect of it. <laughs> we we yeah. have conversations all the time. We got to <laughs> communicate. We got to communicate. Um, you know, this is Candid Conversation, Women Changing the Game. We are here with Dallas Wings head coach, Vicki Johnson. FC Dallas Vice President of Partnership Marketing, Megan Miller, and FC Dallas Vice President of Business Development, Melissa Janetta. I am Gina Miller. I work with FC Dallas on the media and communications front. And, and we're talking about misconceptions about being a woman working in sports, challenges and opportunities that being uh, sports industry professionals, both coaches, players, executives, broadcasters, marketers presents. And I was on a chat with a group of students the other day talking about career opportunities <laughs> And it was so insightful, their questions. They were, they were eighth graders from Arlington and their questions were phenomenal. And, and one young lady asked me, when did you realize you were a woman working in sports? And for me, it's not something I thought of until I walked into my very first locker room as an intern for the Houston Rockets in 1995. I walked into the Rockets locker room and uh, I, I, I realized that and I've worked in a lot of locker rooms since then. Um, and then, you know, when I made my first couple mistakes on the air, I was a sportscaster in Guam and, and, and in Guam at the time, there were no celebrities. So if you were on TV in Guam, you were a big deal. And my first mistakes there were, were really magnified. And that continued to be the case, working in Knoxville, working in Dallas, now working at FC Dallas. Um, at work in Los Angeles. It's just, it's just kind of, it comes with the territory if you're a woman working in sports broadcasting. But I've always told people that I've tried to go beyond the whole gender boundary line there or gender identity there and really focus on being the best professional for the job rather than the best woman for the role. So Vicki, I'd like to start this with you because you know I've looked at the coaching numbers in, in, in women's basketball, in, in the NCAA level, there, you can make the case there's, some, there's a little more equity there. And I think in the WNBA, um, it's still a little bit male dominated from a coaching standpoint from a head coaching standpoint and you succeeded in women's basketball throughout your career was there ever a moment where you realized I'm, I'm a woman even though you're playing women's basketball I'm a woman kind of working in a man's industry um yes for sure especially at w mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a it, it's a woman's it's a women's league uh, to this day we only have four uh female coaches in the w uh, which blows my mind, uh, not taking anything away from the guys, uh, the men that's coaching in this league, they're very good. Um, but there are a lot of great female coaches out there, uh, especially former players. Um, I think uh, just having an opportunity, uh, I think the misconception of everything is, is that um, players can't be coaches uh, or players don't really want to work that hard because as a whole, we have been catered to all our lives. And so we don't really want to put in the time uh, that it takes to be a, a, a great coach. Um, and I can say personally, um, I was always um, a player that studied film and uh, thought the game as a coach, saw the game as a coach. You so, are the unicorn, players hate to study film. <laughs> So making that transition to, to a coach was pretty easy for me, uh, but it is a lot of work. Um, when I tell you to do a scouting report, if I was, if I was doing a scouting report on uh, Las Vegas, it would take me three days. Uh, I have to watch at least uh, six games. I have to break down uh, their defense, their offense, um, personnel, and then come back and talk about how we defend them, how can we score, uh, their strength and their weaknesses. So it's a long process. In the midst of that, you still have to be a part of practice. You still have to focus on your, your, your team and you still have to do your duty as a coach. Uh, so uh, it is hard. It is hard to transition from a player to a, to a, to a coach, uh, but there's a lot of amazing female, uh, former athletes and just uh, female uh, coaches out there uh, that can actually uh, can do this job uh, and do, can do it well. I think uh, our league uh, need uh, more women to be role models. Uh, we have always uh, stood up um, for, um, for um, social justice, uh, for our families, 
Uh, we are the we are the backbone of our families uh, in in so many ways, um, and I think it's time for uh, the women to uh, kind of take over the WBA in a sense. I don't know will it happen, uh, but uh, it will in time. And what about you? I mean, you and I were at the Cowboys back in the day. Um, again, it was it was a wonderful wonderful time and wonderful experience at that time. But was there ever a moment where you realized? okay, I kind of am in the minority here as a woman working in the sports industry. And, and was there a challenging response or a way that you had to respond that was, that was hard for you? Sure, you know, listen, we all know that they were known as and, and could be still the good old boys club over there. And but but I was lucky, I was surrounded by um, male and female executives that were strong in what they did. And actually, the majority of my time, I reported into um, a female executive. So I got really lucky in that sense. You know, when did I notice, okay, I'm a female in the male industry? The moment I walked in the door, um, you know, it, it, but things have changed in, in, in 20 years as I'm aging myself here. I think a, a funny story is um, the basic, we did tours all the time back when they were at Valley Ranch. You've got the guys, the players that are in the locker room, they're out of practice. So you have to be very sensitive to the guys that are in, that are in the locker room. You can relate to that. Um, but I wasn't looked at as male or female in that sense. I just took my groups back made sure the locker room was clear and went through, um, you know, the tour. So I think I got lucky. Um, sure, there were a couple instances that were challenging um, where there might be some confrontation. And, you know, something that worked for me at the time is if I was approached at my desk um, by a male executive and, and maybe we had something that was we needed to work out, I mean, Gina, I would actually just stand up at my desk. I found that it wasn't a power play on my side. It just made me really comfortable. I just stood up like, I'm listening to you. Let's have this conversation and let's figure it out. Um, I find when I do that now, it's mostly because I'm just really engaged no matter who I'm talking to. But that did really help me at the time. And if I knew there was going to be a conversation with a male executive that might be more difficult. I tried to do it in a, when we were both standing. Um, it, it just worked better for me at the time. But yeah, I got lucky to actually work with some really powerful females over there too. So, yeah. I agree. It was a great group of, of leadership over there as well. What about you, Melissa? I mean, you, you do a lot of sales calls and a lot of sales presentations. And I can only imagine, as you've been coming up throughout the course of your career, um, some of the challenges you might have faced. Was there a point, though, where you really had that moment? You're like, wow, I am kind of the only one in the room here. And how did you respond to that? Yeah, um, I would say, and and trying not to be repetitive because I think I have some of the similar similar realizations as the as all of you on the call but um, you know my first year starting in in um, sponsorship sales for FC Dallas was a tough one and I think I, I was ready to quit because of the challenges we, we talked about earlier and Kathy Carter who I believe at the time she was the president of soccer marketing was intense. If you can remain on the revenue generating side of the sports industry, you will be a dime a dozen. And at that point, it was like, it, it came, she was giving me advice, but I took it as a challenge. And so, you know, rising to that challenge and really being a student of um, my craft, if you will, in a new industry, um, the pieces just kind of came together. Um, yes, there's been a lot of, of board meetings and, and meetings that I've sat in that I've been the only female in the room. And so that is very obvious to, you know, to realize, but I take that same mentality of being, you know, what a privilege to be a trailblazer uh, for other females and young females that want to come up um, in the same role as I'm in. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And I think that's such a good point. And I think that's why conversations like this are so important because not aging ourselves to make this point, but I think all of us on this call um, have, have been in the business long enough, if you will, where we might have been the first in our markets, in our roles, at a position, at a team. We might have been the first. And we've all kind of been 
in, in that position of wanting to see someone like us or just bounce some ideas to just pick the brain of someone who might be going through the same thing that we're going through. So that's really one of the points of this of this conversation right here, this candid conversation about women who really are changing the game. And, and hopefully that uh, others can see that there are other people who you can talk to and lean on for insight, advice, expertise, things of that nature. Um, when you think about wanting to excel in this industry and getting into a leadership role, um, and we talked about key factors to success. Are there any tactics, Megan, that you would recommend for someone who really wants to dive into a leadership opportunity with a franchise or in that kind of role? Sure. Um, I've believed this since I was young, be the hardest worker in the room. Um, whatever it takes. Um, it, it's I'm, I'm trying to think of how I can elaborate really well on this because you've also heard, you know, work smarter, not harder. Um, sure, that's absolutely true, but I will do whatever it takes. So I would say to anyone, um, it does not come easy. So be the, be the one that's willing to put in the work. But I also look at how many sports management programs there are across the country now. And you think about how many professional teams there are and in this industry. We've got 27 teams in Major League Soccer in 2021. You've got 32 NFL teams. There are rare opportunities in these fields. So I would say network, intern, start young because you know, when we get applications, um, even here at FC Dallas in our department, we can get hundreds of applications in a few days. And that's just if they're coming in at entry level. So you've got to get your foot in the door with these programs and then be willing to put in the work, be willing to be open to ideas um, because we can't be stagnant in how we think. There is so much there I want to dive into. Networking, you're only as strong as your network. Having a growth mindset throughout the course of your career. When I started in broadcasting, the stuff they taught back in the 90s isn't even in existence now. So growth mindset is so important. I always tell aspiring sports broadcasting media professionals very tactically to start now because with a cell phone, you can be a broadcaster. You can absolutely be a broadcaster and, and cultivate that, that skill set there and, and get those repetitions in so that you can become better and stronger. Melissa, what advice do you have for someone who wants to excel in sales? And, and not just, you know, we know sales is all encompassing, but whether it be ticketing sales or huge sponsorship sales, both are equally important to a franchise's success. What's critical to success for someone who wants to get in a leadership role there? Yeah, so in our role, it's it's pretty straightforward in terms of you're measured by a number. So you have a goal, you have a target. Um, so I would say by all means necessary, you know, hit that target, hit those numbers. Um, and that might mean working weekends, you know, working longer than just nine to five and shutting off your computer and going home. I think Vicky said this earlier, make sure that you're you're the solution. So there should be no task that you're too big for. So if you are selling, you know, during the week, but on the weekend, you know, perhaps Gina needs some help in the, in the um, press box, media world, you know, offer yourself up to do that. Um, I think it, you know, will not only round you out in terms of experience, um, but if for some reason you may be falling short of that number, you could maybe have a little, uh, a little grace given to you because you are such an asset to the organization. Such good advice there. Being that person who's open and willing to do it and be a team team leader and team player. And, and ultimately at the end of the day, there's a number to focus on. Vicki, I know that you're judged on numbers, <laughs> wins and losses at the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. But for somebody who aspires to be a coach, and we know that there are people who may not be successful basketball players who have gone on to become successful basketball coaches or soccer players who've gone on to become successful coaches. Um, what advice do you have for someone who wants to be a successful coach? I think um, self-awareness is very important. Um, know who you are as a person. Um, uh, know what you stand for. You know, uh, know who you are as a, per as a person. Know your purpose. Know your vision. Um, 
do things with intent, uh, not for attention. Um, and, and then um, to be a great leader, I think you have to take action more than just talking about it. You have to be about it. And I think uh, transparency is, is very important as well. Uh, open communication. Um, and in our business, uh, by me being a head coach, um, it's hard for a player to come and, and really voice their opinion uh, because they, they may be afraid of getting cut, uh, not getting playing time. Uh, but the one thing I express uh, to my new team is, is I want open communication and I want honest communication because that's the only way we can grow as, as a team, and not only a team, a family. Uh, because I look at my players as 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 part of my family, and so I take great pride in in taking care of my family, and so now they're a part of my family. So I think open communication and honesty, and, and know who you are, know who you are, so you won't fall for anything, uh, and do everything with intent. So many similarities there. I mean, we look at our teammates and our, our employees and staff members as teammates and family members and that open communication that both you, Megan and Melissa all stress, so important. Um, as we approach the four o'clock hour here, I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time and our viewers' time. Um, we are talking about women changing the game, the game in sports, but at the end of the day, we all get into this business because it is fun. I joke with everyone, it's <laughs> working for a living. It's work, but right. it's been working for a living. Each of us has gotten to experience something we would have never gotten a chance to experience. I, I won an NBA championship ring. I, I got to throw the football with Roger Staubach, you know, just things you never get to experience. Right. Um, Melissa, I'll kick it off with you. What has been your biggest pinch me moment working in the sports industry? So um, through FC Dallas and our foundation, I had the opportunity to go to the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. Um, I was able to attend three of the matches in Curitiba in Brazil, which was dream, um, lifetime dream. But I was also able to um, teach soccer clinics in the favelas um, around Curitiba, which was so rewarding. Um, you know, soccer is such a big part of the culture there. Um, and so to be able to give back and, and um, spend time um, with uh, the community there in Brazil while I was there attending the World Cup was just a dream come true. That's amazing. I can only imagine like 13 year old Melissa imagining that as a total dream. I can only imagine. Unbelievable. <laughs> what a moment. Oh my gosh. Vicki, what about you? Uh, I played in the first uh, WBA game in uh, 97 in, 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 in LA. Uh, most people would say uh, that would be uh, my pinch you moment. Uh, I played in five finals. I've been to uh, one final as, as an assistant coach. Uh, I won championships overseas. I played 15 years. Um, but my pinch you moment is, is now being the head coach for the Dallas Wings. I've been here, I've been living in Dallas since 2004. Uh, for 25 years, uh, I've been a part of the WBA. Uh, I have been packing up, leaving for six months and not having the opportunity to be home uh, and be able to coach in the place that I live uh, is, is a dream come true. It's, it's a blessing for me. I understand that. And, and you bring up something that we didn't even touch on. In the sports industry, you typically move around a lot. And to be able to work in markets in which we love, in which we grew up, is, is very special. I know Megan is a Dallas native. I'm a Dallas native. You live in Dallas. Melissa's a Dallas native. She's been here more than a decade, so we can claim her. But you know, <laughs> hometown is, is, is very, very special. Megan, what about you? What was your biggest pinch me moment? Oh, my gosh, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's so many I could think about, but I, I'm, I'm going to tell you one from um, FC Dallas because this is top of my list. It never, ever gets old hearing the crowd roar. It doesn't matter how long you're in sports, you get chills. And I think back to 2016 when FC Dallas won the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. And we were busy with games and events. We had a partner summit and when we won at that moment, it was during the week and the crowd was just so loud and crazy that night. 
that the chills from that moment, I will never forget where I was sitting. I will never forget watching that match. So that, that would be mine. I mean, you know, there's, there's tons through football and I mean, even being here in Dallas, other sports, but that one was incredibly special experiencing that with the Hunt family here for sure. And that's the great thing about sports, I think, is that we all get to experience magical moments together. You know, we do, we all get to experience magical moments together. And I think what's unique about this conversation is each of us have different career paths. You know, Vicki grew up playing basketball and, and, and played at La Tech and Ruston. And Melissa grew up in Michigan playing, playing at Michigan State. And Megan's a Dallas native. We overlapped a little bit, but our career paths were wildly divergent. But each of us have tenure in the industry, which I think is an accomplishment right. in and of itself, because working nights, weekends, and holidays for the rest of your life can certainly turn off a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Students don't believe me, but it's true. Nights, weekends, and holidays, rest of your life. Um, and, and, and not just tenure, but, but tenure in leadership roles. And I think that's very impressive. So as we close here, um, if you were to describe, you know, what it takes to be a game changer in your particular role, you could just describe it very quickly. What would it take for someone to be a game changer in a role like yours, Vicki? Um, know who you are. Uh, have a vision, have a purpose, and go for it. Uh, don't allow anyone to, uh, to tell you no. Don't let anyone take your dreams away. Uh, but it's going to take hard work. Uh, you are, you going to hear a lot of no's. Uh, before uh, you get a yes. Uh, this is my second time around as a head coach and I'm very grateful. Uh, and so whatever, whenever you get a chance uh, to do what you love, uh, put, pour your whole heart, your whole soul into it. I love it. I love it. Megan, what about you? Don't be scared to surround yourself with people better than you. I mean, that's our job as a leader is to have a great team. You know, I'll give a shout out to um, Cody and Bryn and Haley and Hannah. You know, we work with uh, Melissa day in and day out. She's taught me so much, you know, being here with you every day. I could go on and on, but um, it, it's what makes you stronger. It's what makes you better. Um, so I'm very lucky. So I would just say, don't be scared to do that. Melissa, what about you? If you think about being a game changer in, in your role, what advice do you have for someone to, to try who is aspiring to do the same? Yeah, I would say just going back to Vicki's um, uh, comment about baking the cake, you have to be a student of your craft. So, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have another talented woman that works on my team and, and even on the weekends, whether, whether we're watching, you know, the Super Bowl or, you know, um, a show like The Bachelor, we're talking about what brands are doing and what we think is cool. And it's because we love it and we're so passionate about it. So continue to learn, be, never be humbled where you feel like you have to stop learning, whether it's being a good leader or you know, knowing the next best and greatest thing in technology, things are changing so fast. So always be a student of your craft. Oh my gosh, such good advice. Growth mindset, communication. Don't be afraid of the no. Know your why. Bake the cake with great ingredients. We all want to go eat now. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this was such a great conversation. Thank you, Vicki. I know you're preparing. I mean, the season's coming up, but you got a draft. You got so much that you're preparing to do. I really appreciate your time. Megan and Melissa, we're gearing up for the season opener on April 17th. Everyone is so busy right now. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us on this conversation. We're all easily excited accessible and all very cool. You can always keep in touch. You can follow the Dallas Wings on social media, connect with all of us at FC Dallas. We can put our contact information in the comments section for those of you who want to keep in touch further. Thanks again to each and every one of you for joining us. Thanks to all of our viewers and stay tuned for our next Candid Conversation. Next month, we are going to have former U.S. Women's National Team player Joanna Lohman joining us about how to raise the next generation of future champions as we talk to a few champions here today. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks, Tina.